Okay, now I have to get back under the doona. <laughs> Wiki. Brr, here we are. Ah, with Eleanor Jackson. How are you doing? Very well, how are you? Really good, really, really, really good. I'm uh, loving living life at the moment. So, Me too. Yeah. I just had a very brisk walk home. I'm feeling much invigorated. Beautiful, beautiful. So let's just jump straight into it, shall we? Uh, for those of us who do not know you, do uh, you want to just give a quick introduction? I think there should be plenty of people who don't know me. Um, but my name is Eleanor Jackson and I'm a poet and a performer and an arts producer. But I also wear a lot of other hats and I currently chair the board of Peril Magazine, which looks at Asian Australian arts and culture. But I was prior to that their editor in chief for a number of years. So I have a real advocacy and energy for Asian Australian creative producers. And I also sit on the board of the Stella Prize, which looks at uh, women's, it's a, you know, it's a major women's writing prize, but also looks at the barriers and enablers to women's participation in literary publishing and writing in general. And prior to that, I was on the board of the Queensland Poetry Festival. So I have a real passion for story making and especially oral story making and how that fits within Australia's literary community. Beautiful. Professionally, I manage a research partnership around sustainability. So I have for a long time worked in international and community development, looking around, uh, yeah, questions of community sustainability. That's me. Amazing. And you're based out of Melbourne now, is that right? Sunny Melbourne. Well, I have um, spent time in PNG in Thailand and then more recently about five years in Brisbane, which I really loved. So I feel like I'm pretty lucky to have a bit of a second home somewhere, somewhere a tad warmer. <laughs> True, you can get away during the winters. Mm -hmm. Cool banana. So tell us what you love most about the work you do. Well, I think it's pretty simple. I love story. I think that telling stories and making sense of the world through stories is one of the primary functions of human communities. It's actually a real quality of our thinking and the sense-making way that we relate to the world. And I also think it's one of the great unifiers that we're, we're not often brought together by facts. What we're really brought together by is story and often the place that we see ourselves fitting within those stories. Mm -hmm. And on the, the topic of story, can you just give us a, a quick, uh, an interesting story that maybe you've heard or maybe that you're a part of? Or... Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, you know what? Today I was just telling a story uh, about a woman that I met recently and I was telling it to a friend of mine that I work with and it was such an interesting moment because she recounted back that she had a story incredibly similar. So very recently, a woman got in touch with my father to say that she was, in fact, his half-sister and that my grandmother had had a baby when she was about 18 after a nice uh, connection with a Canadian nablemen who was stationed here in Melbourne during World War II. And her family had sent her to, you know, effectively a wayward girl's home in the, in the mid-40s and required her to give up the child for adoption. And that this woman, um, who was now about 73, was contacting my father to try and reconnect with her family history and to try and learn a bit about her mother, I suppose. And what was really curious about it for me is that she'd obviously, and she had, I mean, she really admitted it, she'd intentionally waited until she knew my nana had passed away. And I was, as I was recounting that story to um, my friend and colleague, she said that her family had had a really similar experience where after a number of years and after grandparents had started to pass away, you know, two or three illegitimate children in their extended family network came out of the woodwork and began to reconnect and try and find ways of reaching out to family that they hadn't known, but really highlighted just how much had changed in terms of women's autonomy in their lives relative to your ability um, 
to, to manage conception, so to not be pregnant, mm -hmm. uh, but also to the position that had changed for women in society around being unwed and pregnant. And it was really, yeah, I think it moved both of us a great deal to think about how different the lives of our grandmas had been by virtue of not having autonomy about that, that area of their life and um, the sense of shame and I think societal uh, ostracization that really came from that position women held um, mm -hmm. time, which is just not all that long ago so I think that's something that we often um, we project elsewhere about communities that aren't as well developed or aren't as sophisticated but really only in two generations really one two generations that has changed so markedly for women um, in ways that I'm so grateful for and what in particular do you feel are the main differences there? Like what kind of freedoms do women have these days that weren't as, uh, you know, accepted? Well, it's also hard to generalise about which women wear and in which time. Mm. So I think at the very highest levels in a country like Australia with women who have, um, you know, who aren't experiencing additional markers of disadvantage, whether that's around race or socioeconomic status or education level. But, you know, for a, a hopeful large proportion of the population, there is a much greater sense of contraceptive freedom, which I think has been undoubtedly one of the biggest shifts for women and continues to be one of the biggest shifts for women because control over how many children you have, who you have them with, and how early you start having them, they're really things that are markers of uh, women's substantive empowerment in a community, not just whether or not women are theoretically well regarded or held in high esteem, but whether or not they have agency over their bodily autonomy. And um, I think that having a child is one of those places where you really lose a lot of autonomy um, for good and for bad. I mean, there's great things that come from that loss of autonomy. We shouldn't necessarily want to see ourselves in these like singular agentified lives we're in control of, but there are many other places where you can um, notice that seeding that autonomy through your childbearing and reproductive roles mm -hmm. disadvantage women a great deal. And has that been something that you've, experience is it something that you've wanted like to always to always raise your own children or is it something that you felt pressure from from this family or society for, to you know they talk about um the, the body clock getting on and these these mm. types of things like is that stuff that is real for you or well i'm filipino australian and it's very strong for my mom a sense that um i've waited far too long to have children so i'm 38 now and about 12 weeks pregnant so she's delighted but she has for the last maybe 20 years spent <laughs> most of her time trying to marry me off and hurry me up to have children including the kind of melodramatic threats of like you know if i'm not going to be a grandma i should put my head in the oven kind of thing so she's reasonably she's reasonably directive about that being the idea but i would say for me personally i've been quite politically and personally opposed to the idea of having kids um you've been out quite outspoken about it well look firstly i mean there's some people who like to put stickers on their bicycles saying one less car i've often thought to put one less kid like they're a big they take a burden on the planet. <laughs> We're all a burden on the planet. Maybe we should. It's the um, biggest, uh, the biggest kind of. It's your biggest carbon footprint. Carbon footprint that you uh, are. You a fan of Utopia? This week? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, that's, that's my sole rationale. But I have had some sense of saying, you know, we don't necessarily all need to have children. I think also as a queer person, I've really wanted to not just validate, you know, validate, but venerate the experiences I have with deliberative families. So people who embrace you by, by virtue of care and love and mutual concern, those people who embrace you as a part of their family and they don't necessarily have to be biologically tied to you. And so I have contemplated places where I might have a female partner and they might really want to give birth to a child. And I could see myself, being really supportive and being a part of that connection. But I haven't necessarily thought that I would like to house the inner alien for the period of the time and then to de-house it 
out of my JJ. I've kind of been a little down on that idea, but I'm coming around on it because I obviously have to. And um, <laughs> acceptance. Yeah. <laughs> the resistance is futile. <laughs> There's a great peacefulness in it. Uh, I think sometimes. Uh, rebellious uh, second generation migrant children never really want to please their parents in exactly the way their parents want to be pleased but having done so I can safely say she's really enjoying it mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know presumably she'll be a very loving grandma so you, you're one of many do you have brothers and sisters who have kids or you're an only child has I have one brother and we're quite estranged. So I don't have a lot of contact with him, but my mum is one of 17. Mm. So she has uh, five half brothers and sisters from her dad's previous marriage. Her mother's first marriage also had five children. Mm. And then her mum and dad's partnership had another seven. Can relate. It's so crazy. The, the difference, uh, how many people, how many children people were having mm. my dad's one of 13 or 14 like yeah. a couple adopted 12 from mum like yeah your mum had 12 children that's it's like hard to fathom <laughs> well and i guess that's exactly what they're talking about you know my grandma and my australian side only had three kids but i suppose um my grandma on the Filipino side was probably another 20 years older than her mm. and so you know in australia even for um Anglo-Saxon communities, they still had families of eight and nine. It was very, very common. And so the comparison sometimes between my Filipino family and my Australian family are often just about a half generation shift, you know, in either way. Uh, but yet there'll often be lots of real linkages about very large family size, lots of pragmatic marriages about how you take care of that many kids. And then now, you know, now in our generation, we're only gonna have a small family. Power in numbers. Power in numbers. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. for, so for you, is that, um, I guess, in terms of relationship models and dynamics, is that uh, something that you've thought about? I know you mentioned, you know, uh, the queer community and being open to this kind of mm. family that is, you know, not kind of traditional. Uh, what's, what are your feels and ideas around, around these kind of concepts? Look, I think I take a real sense of joy from my chosen family and I have written quite extensively with another woman um, we wrote a two-person poetry play called chosen family and that concept's very common very widely used in queer dynamics but I think too you know you use the word chosen family as a part to kind of give it a sense of the cherished but also there are lots of deliberative unions that people make which don't fit into normative binary family models and plenty of normative family binary models that don't work well at all. <laughs> and I you know, stuff into this thing that yeah. isn't necessarily obviously working. <laughs> yeah. I was chatting with a really great friend who has begun seeing a man, a heterosexual man, I assume, uh, although I haven't asked him, and he has separated from his partner, but they continue to co-parent their child. And he shares a house with her previous partner who also has a child. And so what the two men have arranged is that they cohabit as housemates, but basically it enables both of their daughters who are half sisters to continue to share a cycle of co-parenting where they remain together at all times. So they're together when they're with their mom, they're together when they're with their dads, mm -hmm. even though their dads are different. And I just think, you know, we really sometimes limit ourselves or imagine that it's only so-called aberrant queer or new, new age or indie families that do this. I was like, it's not the case at all. Mm -hmm. Plenty of people, you know, through our generation and preceding generations found really pragmatic ways to share love, to share the practical qualities of family, you know, like mutual care, nourishment, financial security, household, goods, cars, all that kind of stuff. Mm -mm -mm. People have been doing the substance of family for a very long time, even if we haven't entitled them to the benefits of what that naming means and what our culture does to place more in it. And I guess I feel similarly too with the sense of queer relationships and marriage, you know, queer people have been married to each other, like stuck, bored, happy, in love, um, you know, bonded, uh, 
dying. Do you mean all of the big things that are about being married? They've been married irrespective of how our legal system has regarded it. It's just about desiring a way to reconcile that reality with law, not asking for people to mould their lives to statutes, instead saying the whole point of these instruments is to safeguard those things that our community holds dear. Mm. Um, And we think relationships of value and mutual interdependence and care, they count. We think that families and networks of people who support each other, that counts. So Mm. I'd like to see those things change more broadly. Mm -hmm. And that's something that you're into yourself, like marriage. uh, Have you been married before? Getting married uh, next week. Married at the moment. Yeah, cool. (laughs) And that's... uh, I'm literally getting married in seven days. Amazing. Yeah, I never thought we'd get married either. Is that a... Is it going to be a big party and a big celebration? There will be. My greatest sadness is there will not be a lechon, which I really wanted. So a big, like, roast suckling Filipino pig. Um... (laughs) Is that because yeah. somebody's vegan or? <laughs> no, no, it's not that. It's just, it's the middle of winter and it's really hard to cook a full pig not outside. And so it just is much nicer if you're being a big outside sunny place in summertime with air and ventilation. If you just have to be around a giant smoking pig for eight hours in a room, I'm just, or someone's out in the rain doing it in the garage, there's nothing fun. That's not fun. <laughs> Anyway, That's so, congratulations. Thanks. I, don't, I, I never know whether to say congratulations or condolences when it comes to marriage. Look, and I didn't know either. I've been really anti-marriage, mm. really politically anti-marriage. Mm. I've often wondered why LGBTIQ communities have wanted to devote so much energy when, for all intents and purposes, a lot of heteronormative communities have downgraded marriage, I think, in some ways, by the way we have hyper commercialized it's like being like christmas do i think christmas is really a bad idea i was like not really there's plenty of nice thoughts about it and a really complex set of rituals that underpins it but basically going to toy world and spending thousands of dollars on wasteful plastics (laughs) seems like a terrible idea and i don't know why there's a holiday for that kind of shopping extravaganza and for weddings if you reduce them to their mere commercial outlay and to the structural and legal antecedents of them as basically a property contract which used to enshrine women and children as chattels you know you know not not total chattels but this is mine (laughs) this this is mine and yeah and it's i'm gonna sign on the dotted line yeah well it does it inscribes quite a lot of property entitlements it's a contract Mm. um Yeah, so at its most reductive level, I've often been quite anti it and felt that while there were, you know, lots of other forms of really substantive discrimination, so, um, you know, an inability to expunge old uh, sodomy prosecutions in Queensland. And I was like, why don't we throw our energy and weight as a community behind rectifying situations that once imprisoned totally innocent men and now preclude them from, you know, traveling to the States because they have a criminal record or, you know, all the other kinds of things that shame people uh, by virtue of being considered wrong in our community's eyes. Why don't we care about that? Why do we care if um, gay and lesbian couples can get married? I mean, if you want to spend money and, and buy cakes, you can buy those things anyway. <laughs> and so then oddly participating in it has really caused me to think again, firstly about the hypocrisy of participating in it because Uh, in a relationship with a man, I'm conscious that I'm entitled to lots of things that I'm not entitled to when I'm in a relationship with a woman. Mm. But what does that hypocrisy mean for me? And are there ways to be really intentional about how you relate to that, conscious of the limitations and the heritage? Uh, But can you try to reframe that either for yourself or for the people that you love? And it has been a very fascinating process to have really deliberative conversations with my partner about what it means to him and about what it means to me, which I wonder that we might not have had had we just continued as de facto partners or to co-parent in the way that we've intended to. Mm, And what was the deciding factor that made you? Was it there were some some benefits that you... They're talking about the benefits of (sighs) male-to-female marriage. uh, did any of that have anything to do with it or is it more something on a different level? 
in part it was because I actually think that I really recognise that my partner would never ask me to compromise on those values. And so I just thought, I was like, hang on a minute, he would make a lifelong compromise for me and not be griping about it because I'm some rabid anti-capitalist feminist who doesn't want to participate in this structurally heterosexual institution. And I thought, I can bend. Mm. I can bend to, to return the gesture of what that compromise means, particularly if it opens the door to a kind of celebration that I don't know that there are many other ways to do. There aren't a lot of rites of passage in our community. Mm. You have them and you can try to make them, but part of the power of institutions and rituals is that they're not generated just by happening once. Do you mean like a really powerful event that happens once? You know, well, people forget tattoos. You, you know, you can move on, but you get a tattoo a hundred times in the same space and you really remember it and rituals work like that um the limitations of marriage are exactly what makes it a meaningful institution Mm. Uh, its universality isn't derived by its specificity to everyone who participates in it but actually its generic quality the way that it kind of doesn't fit anyone is part of what gives it its structural framing so it's taken a lot to reconcile but it's really much more about quite an individual gesture of love to someone who I think would have such a lot of respect for my values and principles. I was like, this is a meaningful ritual for you and I can participate it, participate conscious of how some parts will not resonate for me. But I can do that because I want you to be able to celebrate with your family in a regime of value that means something to them. They're not going to get it if we like go and have a little pagan ceremony because it's like a wicked woman. Just going to be weirded out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think what I want to allow people is access to joy and you have to take that joy if and where they can find it. There, there sometimes are stretches that you can make with people, but you can't ask them to completely start everything afresh because we are the cumulative nature of all of our cultures. And I think that's too, you know, it's something I talk about more generally, like outside the idea of getting married or having a child now, but about how we get to build layers of cultural experience that give life and community meaning. And sometimes you can change that, but also sometimes you're a part of a legacy and you have to kind of honour it as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we're after a rite of passage. This is the biggest one you could get. And although I did not get my roast suckling pig. <laughs> you get a baby. <laughs> you get a baby. Some consolation prize. There's heaps of crackling on a baby. Um, <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? Like it's so frowned upon to eat them these days. <laughs> I know, right? Uh-huh. If only. Anyway. The, the, yeah, the concept and the, the ideas of rites of passage, is that something that you've, uh, like a field that you've been interested in or, or that you've, felt to to kind of bring about in your own life or 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 those around you like yeah what's your sort of experience with with the rites of passage and these kind of monumental moments in our in our lifetime Mm, i love um the way that we mark time and i think it does it it cycles back to that sense of story that places and times and experiences they're not just value neutral like as much as we have decided that we might want to be in the moment let's just experience everything afresh like engage with the experience as it comes we all know that we're laden with the baggage of the past and that context where we find ourselves the place the space what it's for why we're there all of those things communicate everything communicates all of the time to us. And sometimes we can reconcile that in really simple ways because we phase it out. Like I don't see that. I don't value it. It's not even there. And other times I think it really overwhelms people. And as we journey through communities now in ways that are sometimes increasingly individualistic, they're very instrumental. They ask people to be quite utilitarian about themselves. You know, What is it that's good about you that will eventually make you good to do a job that will earn money so that you can keep doing the job and spending the money? Mm. As we ask people to live lives like that, 
I think that we have lost some of the more fundamental structures about what it means to be a child, what it means to pass from child to adulthood, what it means to pass from adulthood to a place of responsible adulthood, so where parenting sits, and also then how you pass on those generational responsibilities. And I think previously when we had less uh, transmissible forms of communication, so we didn't, you don't have a book, you know, you had to put it on the internet, all the rest of it. You, can't, you couldn't abstract knowledge in the same way. You had to make knowledge quite embodied and personified. Mm. So you had to take people through the things that they learn and make them learn them either by repetition. You know, it's why we pray, it's why we chant, it's how we've learned song, it's how we've memorised, you know, classical poetry from the Greeks. Like that only exists because we used to sit people down and be like, this is the story of us and you have to remember it and you have to tell the next person and the story has to be exactly the same. But we've, you know, we have all of these really great abstracted forms of knowledge now that are separated from the person. So you don't have to learn something by going through it or eating it or being poisoned by it or <laughs> you, know, you just be like, don't eat that, it poisons you. And there's an app of how you can tell, like take a photo of that thing and then the photo will be scanned and then we'll say don't eat it and then you'll be all good. Mm. And Here's your FODMAP app, whatever it is. I don't know. FODMAP's very serious. I don't, you know, uh, I don't personally have any food allergies. So I have friends who do and they're very, very serious about it. Um, is that something yeah. that you see more of in the future? Because I know there's kind of a big movement in it. I hear a lot in the communities that I kind of am involved with about yeah. this resurgence of rites of passage and the importance. And you see men's groups and women's groups in circles. Yeah. And, um, you know, sharing circles and this type of thing popping up a lot and that, this kind of movement back to permaculture and kind of yeah. community li living and communal living and uh, conscious community, these kind of things. Is that is that something you see more of in the future or is it something that you, so. you feel like is going to dwindle more and more with these technologies? And, and whatnot? I don't know. At the same time, I think in Australia at least, I found it uh, really energising to see these changes happening for me. I know it's been quite a personal journey, probably about the way you, yeah, decolonize sounds a bit fancy, but also the way you just kind of overcome self racism in Australia about resiling against your own culture to embrace Australian culture. You realize that what you're actually being asked to do is not embrace a different culture, but actually just lose your own, like get, get to be neutral, get to not really love anything except what everybody else loves don't feel anything immutable about who you are. Um, so I think partly recapturing some of this sense of care and respect for where ritual and community sit has been about overcoming a sense of self-racism in the Australian context, which I think is partly where the success of Australia's colonial project lies. So we ask migrants to do it in a more voluntary sense. Mainstream Australia asks Indigenous to pe people to do it in a really coerced sense. Uh, and more broadly, we then take for granted a kind of way of living and a kind of way of being that is mainstream Australian contemporary urban living, which is actually highly anomalous for the rest of the world. Like you have to understand that as high as we rate on most of the global indices for living, um, how much money we have, how long we live, how few people die in childbirth, all of those indices are great, but it's also... This is not how the rest of the world lives. And when many Australians feel sometimes, I think, entitled or angry that their conditions are very poor, uh, that they don't have enough money for their basic needs, that the government is doing them a disservice for something or the other, and that we need to pay less for our health care, I'm often struck by how much narrow narrowness of viewpoint that requires to say things like that where I was like wow you know you can always want this to be a better country no, no sense no, no problems with that desire but um, taking that from a sense of entitlement and a sense of disadvantage that on mass this is a very very bad place to live is just a lie like it's just really a lie I was like actually we're taking out far too many of the world's resources we could all learn to share a little bit and we might possibly have to pay something for our health care but I think that that could also be called 
you know, corporations tax. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, it's quite mind boggling to think, yeah, like you know, if in, in Jamaica, for instance, we have sometimes water not for like months on end, <laughs> you know, like hot water. Yeah. Oh, wow. It's amazing. You know, so yeah, it's, I, de- I definitely feel you on that one. And I think too, when, um, people in Australia also talk about how little they can share. And so they don't say, oh, I can't share, I can't possibly share. But they talk about things like it's so overcrowded and everything's gentrifying and there's, you know, too many migrants and that kind of stuff. I was like, you know, everybody who gets off the plane here basically cannot get over how much goddamn space there is for individuals. And, you know, I look at my house now, there are two people and one um, emergent fetus in a place where my mum probably lived with 12 other relatives. Uh, And, you know. The way that that was achieved by it was just everyone just sucked it up. I don't imagine that people thought it was fantastic or that they wouldn't have liked a betterment of that situation, but it's very strange how little sucking it up can happen in Australia and how much entitlement when really, I, you know, it's not to begrudge people their benefits or their wellness, but I'm sometimes surprised that it doesn't come with a real sense of gratitude. Mm, there's that word again. It's a funny one. I I was talking to someone um, about this. I started um, weightlifting a couple of years ago, which is really not something that many people associate with my personality. But I just like, I love a power lift so much. It's not even worth thinking about. It's crazy. And it really shifted my uh, sense of where physical exercise uh, lies in that it's not so much a punishment or something that you do in order to get skinny or so that you can fit a particular visual norm. But I was like, this is a privilege. Like, look at all of the things that my body is able to do. And without being too neo-Catholic about it, but I know that that's there. I was like, what a sin to, to waste all of these real options that I have. And I was like, of course I should want to deadlift my body weight. This would be so great. Um, but not so that I can demonstrate any might, but basically because the human body has all of these wonderful capacities, why not extend them or, or go as far as you can personally balance and personally feel um, connected and well to? I definitely vibe on that, yeah. Ooh, and, and such phys- a joy. Physicality is, you know, and it's it's antidepressant, you know, you, you release serotonin, you release yeah. oxytocin, you release dopamine, you know, it's an immediate reward system. So it's like, you know, all that life can be stressful, you know, with mm. a lot of the stuff that we, we've uh, decided to do jobs and, you know, just even leaving the house with all this traffic and <laughs> things like this and crossing the road can be a stress, you know? So mm. um, just to, to use that physical body, I think is, for me personally, I, I absolutely love it. And I, I recommend it for anyone who's kind of feeling like down or feeling like a little bit not themselves or off center. It's like, go for a walk, go for a run, mm-hmm. just exercise. You're going to feel amazing. So super accessible. Um, I just wanted to rewind a little bit because uh, we were chatting before we went live um, and I was asking you about what you feel is the thing that most excites you or the thing that is yeah kind of the, the transmission that you'd love to get across uh, to the world and um yeah you, you started mentioning some uh, really interesting stuff but uh yeah i'd love you to just touch on on some of that stuff uh, before we wrap up if that's cool of course and actually too you know we, we might have felt a bit pinball-y and pinged around different conversations but it's actually a very unifying thread so i think that the thing I care about in my professional and research work, the thing I care about in my art making, the thing I care about in my creative advocacy or, you know, kind of arts uh, management stuff, it's all really very interlinked and it is around cultural sustainability and the idea that there is not just a need to feel concerned about what is our physical environment and how we do or don't overtax the capacity of the planet to to keep us upon it and and everything else upon it too um that we don't just consider the economic so what is it that's required to service our material uh, needs as a planet and the social which is how do we involve as many people or and, and how do we see the equity around our distribution of the natural and then the financial resources like is that a like uh, ecological like the ecological impact 
Well, yeah, the, the whole nexus of those things, the environmental, the financial, and then the social builds that greater community ecology. But I always love to introduce another component and filament to it, um, which is a question of cultural sustainability. Mm. So the idea that the rituals, the languages, the arts, the song, the, the dance, the things that we use to inscribe meaning into life, they're not just products that we produce, things that we can ascribe material value to, but they're actually meaning-making mechanisms. So ways that we understand what it means to be in the world that those qualities of culture are the reason why we would care about the environment, why we want to leave a legacy better for next generation, why we would seek to make that equitable, why we would take a hit in our financial personal needs to, to create sufficiency for more people in a, in a net way. Um, and so I often really try to advocate for people's participation in the arts, not in a mere community development way although I don't, I don't want to be dismissive about that but I was like yeah it's really nice for people to just participate <laughs> I'm like oh, it's not just that it's not just nice it's actually integral and I think that, yeah I feel like I feel like indigenous communities have been screaming that at us and really saying it's like loss of culture tears people apart and I think that migrant communities have been saying it in different ways, in different kinds of dysfunctions. I think. Can you give us an example of what you're referring to? Well, you know, when we talk about this kind of new terrorism, new security world where we want to understand why people radicalize. And there's actually not all that much credible evidence that people radicalize just because the internet came up to them. People radicalise, which I hate even the verb. I think it's such a dumb verb and a dumb description. People often want to be a part of something with meaning. And if what we're offering in, you know, go to school, go to uni, get a job, work at it, spend money, buy stuff, die, if what we're offering in terms of mainstream, individualised, high capitalist life is meaningless, then it really behooves us to not be quite so surprised when what people opt for is meaning and ritual and valor and purpose and higher order and, and camaraderie and brotherhood and loyalty. Like those things are powerful motivators for us. And we have for good and for bad, like we have crossed the seas, fought wars, colonized country. We've done plenty of bad things for those same reasons. And I think sometimes it's a little bit coy when we act naive about why that happens as if it's about malfunctioning adolescent boys. When I was kind of like, no, that is, that is the driver. Like that is the engine of humanity is to have life of meaning. Like people don't just want to eat shit and die. Like it is not enough to fulfill your biological needs. Part of the human spirit is it's, existential angst and then desire to change the world around it mm. so i don't see culture as just this like luxury commodity for people who have money to afford a pottery class i feel like being able to express a culture speak a language cook a food make a dance have a deity you know the robust melange of those things is actually where we hope to sift through values for a better and stronger community and yeah art making is a part of that i want there to be the pottery classes but i also don't want them to be there as if they're about luxury diversions for a consumer society i was like hmm they're the these are the roots of joy and if we worked and operated from places where our communities were trying to seek the best and kindest ways to offer that sort of joy to each other, we wouldn't necessarily be prioritising how, how we can make our kids more efficient so that they can compete in the electronics industry. We might be talking about how we get a better renewable energy sector in this place so that we don't leave them with nothing to live in except for conflict about where they get primary resources like water and energy. Mm. Um, and so, you know... I don't want to um, get all you know, super romantic and naive and be like, the arts will save the world. 
but but, really, it kind of, but it kind of will <laughs> yeah but i really do think that mm-hmm. connected cultures connected cultures will make a huge difference mm. to the world because and they're they, they're not just a product they change the rationale of why we come together 100 mm, percent. and this is something that you were talking about i know you mentioned that you were doing you were presenting a it was a talk or a presentation uh, the other day mm. or the other week uh, is this something that you talk about during these types of presentations and that you offer mm-hmm. some kind of solutions towards or is this uh a little bit yeah. i would say too i mean i don't know if it'll happen but more recently um cpa so the you know the accountants professional body and they're going through a whole bunch of scandalous uh trauma at the moment they asked if i would talk to their delegates so about ten thousand folk who come to their conference are asked to talk to them about cultural sustainability and i think particularly for business um there are real values you know i spoke at an interesting conversation at a conference called the business romantic Um, But that was basically saying that, you know, in a world where we will make efficient through robotics, through technology, we'll make efficient many kinds of work, the things that humans will do will necessarily need to be the idiosyncratic and the slightly magical that comes from the diverse thinking of multiple minds. So not just one program doing it as best as it can, because robots will do that better for us. But the thing that robots can't do is be 10 people around a table who all think, feel and dream differently and then approach a problem creatively by virtue of nothing that is in one person's head, like no triumph of singular ideas, but actually the collaborative contest of all of that experience, which isn't something that can be merely programmed to replicate efficiently or to deliver through a robot. And that that sort of stuff really taps into why you would care about cultural sustainability because we unlearn to be creative we see when we transition from children to adults how much participating in normative society is about unlearning the magical part of your kid that like drives in the car with you and narrates every single thing they see and every single thing is magic or different or a dragon lives there or that is a frog car like the things that kids will think are often really unlearned out of them Mm. in order to make them say that is a car and that is a bus and that is a pedestrian crossing and you obey the lights when that green thing comes on and you stop when the red thing comes on not the lights are talking to us. <laughs> Who is that guy? <laughs> so I think we really know that we do that in the transition to adult learning and adult learning styles, but we do that on mass as a culture as we have progressively homogenized our communities. So, you know, we want lives that look like the lives on television rather than we grew up in a really small village. And surprisingly enough, we had a very different language and set of dances and set of foods to these people who lived on the other side of the mountains, because frankly, the giant landslides really put us off walking that way. And so we had to entertain ourselves. So we've actually had these increasingly homogenized communities as we drift into urban living, where the structural environment the way of getting food, water and energy to them, they start to create the pathways of how you can relate to each other um, because you've, you, you have to kind of service those systems. Mm. I don't want us all to live in, you know, like new agrarian huts or anything and where we all have to sing. Genghis Khan. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? I was like, I don't need this. But I do think that there are ways that we can let in that light a little bit in ways that I think are quite intuitive for most people. It's why people get such joy out of it. Like no one takes delight in making things more efficient. I suppose some people do actually, but there is a pure. Talk talk to some engineers. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I was like, I was like, actually my sister-in-law works in audit and she's pretty into order and efficiency, but she also makes some pretty mean um, baked goods. So do you know what I mean? There is a creative space in her that can ice a cupcake like nobody's business. Yeah, beautiful. And um, so successful, or what does yeah, what does a successful kind of cultural sustainability look like, and what is what is unsuccessful, or what is non beneficial versus kind of beneficial as individually for yourself, but also for like if you talk about 
the bigger picture as well. Yeah, look, and you know, I'm not entirely sure if I think that what culturally sustainable communities look like is about a 180 change because it isn't necessarily, you know, there are plenty of realist ways where we're going to want to have things that are fair and just and efficient. We'll want the lights to turn on, we'll want the toilets to flush, we'll want the cars to drive in an orderly fashion. But I do think that we would start to embrace other measures of success and maybe I'm going to return to a um, theme that we started with at the beginning. But if the major point of being an adult is to work, to be productive and to continue to do that, to contribute, you know, you return stuff to the tax base that makes you useful. This is very reductive. Nobody, nobody obviously tells you these things, but if that's one of the primary things that you're meant to do, it makes sense why we've tried to organise things like external childcare or maternity leave or all those kinds of things. But we also have it at a kind of sufficient level. So we want people to be able to do that, but we don't want them to do that too much. Whereas, you know, cultures that have a different sense of wellness, they might do something like Scandinavian countries do. It's like, here's a year compulsory for women, or not compulsory, but here's a year for women and here's a year for men. Like we think that both parents or both parties, because it may not be a man and a woman, but, you know, we think that the carers of this child should have a chance to be there because not only do we know that it makes you a better person longer term to have good, stable, early childhood experiences, therefore you can get on the treadmill, work, 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 die, etc. But we also think that there is a place where it nourishes our culture and our return to take care of things. Similarly with aged care facilities, like we love to think that we have great improvements in best practice aged care. And I'm not assuming that everybody wants to care for their elderly relatives, but we might not see it as a pinnacle of society that you plan carefully for your own retirement to be cared for by third party participants. We might actually think it's okay and great to care for your elderly relatives and parents in your home, we might think it's worthwhile to prolong the lives of elderly people another three months, even though we know a hip replacement is probably not a great idea. But do you know what I mean? Like when we start to reduce mm. each other to what it is that we can do, when the ways that we care for our sick, the ways that we care for people who's, who may have be living with a disability, like the, the way that we seem to value those lives as less because they're not productive lives. I think that that would shift and change if you started to see alternative contributions as being valued in a society. And, you know, it isn't to fracture the fabric or fracture the metaphor, whatever it is I'm going with, um, but just to offer a multiplicity of possibilities of what it would mean to live and have value in the world that I think we would change our viewpoint perhaps on how we see ability, how we see youth, how we see age, how we see gender. Um, if we found other hallmarks of what was beautiful and valuable and contributed back uh, beyond the practical and the financial returns. But, you know, mm -hmm. I think that I think communities are getting better. <laughs> Definitely. And, and taking a page from these, you know, like the indigenous cultures and the ones that, uh, you know, successful quote unquote, is because they've been around for, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know. And cultures totally are. Like plenty, I think that um, it is one of those really shifting tides of, of colonialism the communities are saying you know yes there are real benefits in the way that we have integrated into the global economy but there are also real things that we have lost by whether it's income sustainability or food sustainability you know when you move from being a farmer to being a factory worker those things aren't a linear progression from bad to good they're different, they're a change they might be the reality that we're all dealing with but I think people are turning away from the assumption that development, you know, we used to have a farm and be peasants. Now we can have an office and have RSI. But that is a really, that's a limited view of where communities and cultures can go. And I think actually as crazy as it sounds, 
I take a kind of willful optimism to it as like the population is going to crack, you know, 10 billion by 2050 or whatever it is. I'm like, Oh my God, I may potentially be alive for this. (laughs) He's hoping I'm not. No, I may potentially be alive for this, but I actually think that in that something has to buckle and change. And I really have faith that culturally we have changed many, many times before. Mm. So my grandma's life is unfathomable to me, but also Australia 200 years ago is unfathomable to me. The US 400 years ago is unfathomable to me. So I was like, you know what, if we take the perspective of change as just our own lives and what we will materially benefit from, then I think you have to be quite despondent because it probably looks like we're going to have more economic stress, collapse and tyrannical right-wing leaders, idiots in charge of stuff. But then if you take a trajectory of change that is much longer, I kind of have to say, I was like, there are more girls educated now in the world than there have ever been as a percentage of population. There are more women in government. There are, you know, fewer people die of the kinds of preventable diseases that we continue to rail against in, in many, many places. And I was like, you know what? We haven't gone net backwards, but we always have to listen and learn. It's just the, uh, you know, the mass media and what we get shown is is very one-sided. It's a a large part of it, but it it does exist. The other side of the coin or the other perspective of awesomeness that is happening, it does exist and it's just a matter of... uh, looking for it and you know opening your eyes to it and having that kind of yeah awareness to it i also think too it's been really about being conscious about your media sources because short-term news cycles um both the quality of journalism has eroded in many places because of the changing economic mechanisms that supported journalism but also journalism has been really driven by negative news focus for a long time. We just have a lot more of it. And so I think that if you're finding yourself in a place where you're so saturated by bad news that's intentionally designed to make you feel either inadequate um, or disempowered because how else could you shop yourself out of the oblivion? It was like the Murray Claire method. I opened the magazine with a little article about you know, poor factory workers in Bangladesh. And then they're like, buy something from Louis Vuitton because it will make you feel better. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so much of our news has this real um, push me, pull me, seeing where you need to feel depressed and then elated by the solution offered to you. But I was listening to a podcast recently that was looking at the political roots of violence. And although we talk a lot about the rise of right-wing violence and they were analysing the states. They were also saying that if you take the 100-year trajectory and look at it, we have far fewer people die of homicides and violent deaths than we ever had before. We feel far more news about it. We feel far more afraid of it. We let that then make us acutely aware of who is the other and then start to dehumanise them. But actually, if we were to take a more evidence-based approach, We don't. We've got far fewer people killing each other in the street than one used to when you didn't have any um, adequate police regulation or security and support and people were much more um, fragile about the resources they had to share. Especially if you talk percentage-wise or per capita, you you look at coming back to Genghis Khan, I think there was 400 billion people or 400 million people around at the time and how many people died in wars 40 to 80 million people were killed by by his army yeah (laughs) you're like "Hmm, that's a proportionate you are very very effective and that's the thing like i think i'm far more do you know what i mean i'm not so much worried about no i mean who who am i to be worried about things i'm worried about everything um but i don't want to focus on the individual teenager who we're worried about radicalizing and joining Islam in the jihadi fight against the so-called miraculous cultures that we have are much more concerned about untrammeled state violence. Do you know what I mean? The things that happen, the states are much more efficient about it. So whether or not we question what happens in um, Yemen or the Ukraine or in Syria, like when we look at those things, I was like, look, one-on-one interpersonal violence is complex and it's hard. But actually, if the world's watch needs to be on things, I want to know why we're fatigued about 
famines in the Sudan? I mean, why are we too tired to pay attention to, you know, one of the worst food crises emerging in a country that we sought to help liberate and end fracture civil war of multiple decades um, because we would rather feel upset that some poor teenage boy from Altona has really lost an ability to be in our society anymore. The one life is still valuable, but we'll often devote a huge amount of news attention to it. Um, and I think sometimes it's a real misdirection. Mm. It's a bit of desensitization, obviously, yeah. obviously as well. We get how many how many suicide bombers do have to you know more have to happen in order for us to have that same effect mm. with that that kind of that mind control kind of that you're talking about mm. uh, mind numbingness and cool thanks for your thoughts there the uh, something was coming through as you were talking earlier and it was uh, just a question uh, regarding your poetry do you have any kind of pieces uh, that you would care to share oh no i didn't I, mean, I didn't know I was going to have to tell you a poem. <sighs> oh no, that's too that's too hard to think about. Um, that's too hard to think do, do, about. Do you, do you memorize yours, or do you? Do you... I do often. Um, they also usually go for about twelve minutes. See what I mean? So I tend to do kind of longer form poetry. I used to do more slam stuff, but I think it would be a bit too much. And actually, too, at the moment, the only poetry I'm writing, I'm trying to write my. Um, poem for the vowels. I could maybe read you that one. But I don't know. Oh. Yes, please. Even my, even my future husband hasn't heard that. All right, well. He won't care. It'll be, this will be released afterwards anyway. Uh, yeah, also too. I, he won't listen. <laughs> <laughs> In the, it's a fine. So these are, I am, um, yeah, these are for my wedding vows. Amazing. There you go. In that quiet. Please don't think that I don't love you in the champagne din. I love champagne as much as the next girl. More if the champagne is glossy and apple on the tongue, not sharp and cheap like talk back and bad shoes. So of course, I love you in that tinted glow because you are handsome and kind and you like champagne too. And who wouldn't love you then? It's just that in the quiet, I thee wed. The quiet before you say something I know you were going to say. The quiet before you say something entirely unexpected. The quiet in which you open the car door before you have even left the house because you know I will be cold in the street waiting. Silence in which I roll out the bins to save you from doing so when you come home so very late from work. The pool of liquid still when you are doing the bathroom because you know I'm petrified that the shower cleaner will easy off bam the unborn baby, not just the shower scum. The sliver of hush when I spy a pile of roadside treasure and you spy it too and we both know we will stop though surely there is nothing that we need or don't have two of already and yet we stop and in that quiet I be wed. The quiet heart blink pause before I roll my eyes because you are running late for leaving again or you are reading the Aldi catalogue in bed or somehow you are at Bunnings when there can be no human need to be at Bunnings, not when you were just there last week or last night and didn't we discuss this? And I realise that it is so very rare for a person to be so utterly themselves that you might be able to trust them, perhaps even come to rely upon them bedrock homecoming and in that quiet ivy wed and sometimes at night when the trams passing seem docile unruffling the black hours between night and morn when i am tucked against the question mark of your back so short i cannot reach your neck with a kiss and my feet dangle themselves about your knees i console myself to place my lips against the center of your thoracic and you interrupt the sweetness of the night with your flatulence on my leg. And I tuck the nuptial blanket down tight. And in that quiet, I feel wed because I know you had to listen to me snoring. And with that ring and that cake of our bodies, their humilities, 
your person, my ordinary, the confetti of this every day, the vows of these routines, all the glossy and apple of joy upon the tongue in that muted, tinted glow in that quiet, I thee wed. Amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Marries. <laughs> very, very quiet. <laughs> Tell him. Very, very, very lovely. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing. No and finally, is there something I ask all my guests? Is is there something that you'd like to leave the community with the, the listeners with a question, a concept, an idea, something that's uh, something that's maybe helps you or changed your life in a, in a kind of meaningful or positive way. Yeah, just what would you like to leave the, the tribe with? You can take a moment. You don't have to jump mm. straight in. It all sound like such a truism, but everybody has a story. And I think that if you can take pleasure in the small stories, then you will find life to be bountiful and joyous precisely because that smallness of story is something that knits us all together. So many people want to be a part of the hero story, like to be in charge of things, but I was like, Nothing happens at the end of those movies when they cut after the giant battle scene and all the rest of us like nothing happens. The stories end and we keep trying to make sequels to them and these big black like, Marvel action-y things. But I was like, but the miracle of little stories happens all the time and gives so much more meaning to the way that we really exist. And yeah, I just think that that limitlessness of beauty is something that I'm eternally grateful for. Beautiful. Thank you so much. I'm eternally grateful for you. For no joining. worries. You have a really great night. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of living life in the flow zone. Well, uh, let, me, let me know when to share. We'll do uh, until next time. Okay. Rock on. <laughs>